I, I do a lot of presentations, and honestly, guys, I wish I had that to do it. You'll see it in, in, a, in a second. Um, the, next, the next speaker, Tony, is a serial entrepreneur. He's been building so many startups that you cannot even think about it for so long that most of you were not even born by the time he had to make his first startup. And also, uh, he's been running a program uh, trying to figure out what makes an entrepreneur. And he's, he's doing that with the help of more than 25,000 people around the world, business builders trying to find the essence, the DNA of what makes an entrepreneur and what makes a founder. So please welcome Tony Chan. Thank you, Paul. Hey, Tony. Thank you, Paul. That looks amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Really. Thanks, everyone. Great to be here in uh, Paris and uh, Le Web. So we're going to have some fun today, and uh, I'm going to demo this new presentation platform, Scroll Motion, but really talk about the content of our research on entrepreneurs. So wayfinding for the entrepreneur. Every day, entrepreneurs have to navigate in an ocean of ambiguity, a sea of almost endless choices. It's our day job. But perhaps the best experts ever in the world to always find the right direction were the ancient Polynesians, what Wade Davis called in his 2009 seminal book, Wayfinders. These were ancient Polynesians who can go across traverse oceans and find the exact island they want to go to without any modern instrumentation. No compass, no map, no radar. Instead, they felt the reverberations on the bottom of their hulls. They looked at the positioning of clouds, the position where the sun set and rose, and from there, looking at their inner self, and a theme I'll talk about, pattern recognition, were able to get to exactly where they wanted to go. So today, I'm going to use that metaphor of wayfinding to talk about entrepreneurship today and in the next 10 years. So, entrepreneurship, next 10 years and next 15 minutes. A little bit on background input to the research. What are some of the trends and archetypes of entrepreneurship? What are timeless truths that won't only be here today, next decade, but next century? Wayfinding. How do you actually find that direction? And why does it matter at all? Background and inputs. So three buckets, a little bit of experience, lots of conversations with lots of better entrepreneurs than ourselves, people like you, and uh, a lot of research over the last few years in collaboration with Harvard Business School. So on the experience front, I've uh, been fortunate to be part of uh, the earliest commercialization of the internet back in the day when uh, Loic, I think, had his fifth company. And uh, from there, uh, became part of the transformation of taking a newspaper company working with the CEO to what today became Thomson Reuters. And more recently, uh, started my own venture firm called Cuball. On the conversation front, through that experience, we were able to just have great conversations with a lot of people. And it was very fortunate for us that we just started digitally recording some of these conversations, including with yours truly, over the past few years. After having those conversations, asking entrepreneurs through the world, what really makes you tick? What drives your success? What caused a failure? We formalized a piece of research that we affectionately call the Entrepreneurial Aptitude Test. All of you could try this at hsgl.com. Uh, we also have codified this in a book, and I think we're giving away uh, to the first 100 or 150 people after Meet the Speakers, um, the book. But um, what, what we did through the research is we went through and we asked a series of questions. It's like a psychometric test like a Myers-Briggs or PI. And this is just one small section of it. But we asked entrepreneurs, are you driven more by your brilliance or boldness, passion, people skills, analytical, such questions. And what you notice, there's no one right or wrong answer. What the test does online, takes seven minutes, you can all try it, is it looks at your pattern of decision making and tries to determine what trait you're really dominated by. But the other thing we found through this research is that at this moment in time, more so in my last 15 years of being an entrepreneur, is that we have an ever-expanding ocean of trends and archetypes. Now, there are many, many different types of trends and archetypes. 
I'm only going to highlight four. One of the ones that are missing here is from LeWeb in London, where we talked about the share economy. But four mega trends that I see in archetypes of entrepreneurs are as follows. First, the algorithmic. That's all about big data, the data scientist, explosion there. Second, women. Geraldine is doing a, a panel tomorrow. Merci, Geraldine, on women. I, I, I look forward to the day when we come to a LeWeb or a TED or a Davos where it sounds very strange to do a session on women entrepreneurs, as strange as it would sound like we're going to do a session on men in entrepreneurship. And the real great thing here is that we're seeing an increasing balance like never before. Of revenue companies of greater than 10 million, you now have approaching a, a, a run rate of 50% owned by women, but the gap in technology is still real. Yet, the recent study uh, in work that we've done and by Dow Jones shows that where there's a woman on the founding team, the chance of success is about 2x. And we all know that as guys, but we don't have the EQ that women do to actually act quicker on that. Interdependent entrepreneur. This is about almost every startup today is a multinational day one. We are increasingly interconnected, interdependent, and need to think globally from the start. And in high tech to low tech, what James Slavitz called the end to end experience driven entrepreneur. I'm just going to highlight um, two or three of these a little bit more. Let me start algorithmically. 15,000. 15,000 percent. That is the increase in number of data scientist jobs, a job description that almost did not exist, okay, a few years ago, formally, between 2011 and 2012. 65 percent. That's the volume of equity trading that is done quantitatively or high-frequency equity trading in the U.S. What does that mean? Ten years ago, we used to invest in public stocks like this. You actually look at the people. What does the company do? Does it have a competitive advantage? Today, you look at just supply, demand patterns, blips on a screen, capture the moment. It's almost like playing a video game. Two-thirds of all trades are done almost algorithmically. Now, the third one, 26 out of 30. I'm from Boston. Uh, we uh, recently won the World Series in baseball, World Series, even though it involved only American teams, I know. But still, we won, and we're very proud of it. And, um, you know, what's amazing about baseball is that since the time of a gentleman, Billy Bean of the Oakland A's, we now have formalized analytics. 26 out of 30 Major League Baseball teams today have formal analytical algorithmic uh, staff with them. Now, let me just talk briefly on high to low tech and this, 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 this trend that is really exploding over the next decade driven by the Internet of Things. Okay? We heard earlier this morning from Uber, what is the Internet of Things and what is the end-to-end, E-to-E entrepreneur? The E-to-E -E entrepreneur is about that type of entrepreneur that's taking the everyday mundane task or process and turning it into an extraordinary experience facilitated by ambient, pervasive, internet everywhere web. Digital hailing of a cab we heard about. Something that we just come to expect now, seeing the car come to us, seamless paying. Or think of a company in Cambridge, Glowcap. You walk into a room, you see a soft ambient glow in the corner, and it's your pill cap reminding you to be compliant with your medication. Push a button on the, on the bottom of that pill cap, script auto refilled. And in our own company, a shameless self-promotion in my venture capital company, another company that I was proud to co-found a few years ago, Minilux. This is an effort to Starbuck the nail salon where you get manicures and pedicures. And what are we doing there? We're envisioning a future where you come in, you see that wall of nail colors, and all your previous choices are, are highlighted for you. You go, you look on your phone, the preference of all your texts are there with a countdown timer of when the next one will be ready. You then go and check out service, tip, paid, seamless. Everyday mundane experiences made more convenient, smarter, and more beautiful. Driven by the 24 billion devices that will be connected over the next decade, creating $6.2 trillion in new GDP growth. Now, what about timeless truths? Those are some of the trends and entrepreneurial types over the next decade. But what is always a constant in entrepreneurship? Well, our research that Paul alluded to has crossed now some 25,000 people taking that survey sample that are entrepreneurs and founders. And most important, what we found is that there's four core traits, your heart, 
your smarts, guts, and luck. Okay? So these are the four key traits I'm about to talk about. I'll just repeat them. Heart, smarts, guts, and that elusive quality of luck. So before I go in, just try to think as I describe these, which resonates with you. You're all going to want to say all of them do. You're all thinking in your head you have all of them. But just try to think on a relative basis which one really drives you. So let me start with the quality of heart. And we'll start with a little movie. Jiro. Who's seen that film? Hands up. Okay. All of you who have not seen it, go to your Netflix now. You get nothing else out of this presentation. You're going to get a damn good movie list, I promise you. Okay, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. You know, it's not just about a film about excellence in food. It's a film about excellence in passion, excellence in the heart. And the heart is perhaps the foundational and most important quality in entrepreneurship. And how does the heart reveal itself? Three ways. First, purpose and passion. In the case of Jiro, a singular unwavering commitment to perfection in sushi. Second, what the Greeks call agape, sacrificial love. Many of you as entrepreneurs feel it out there. Doing that thing that is worth caring for, like a maternal love for her child. And third, nuance. Nuance. It separates really great entrepreneurs for those that are just good. Jiro, massaging an octopus for 30 minutes before serving it. The toasting of seaweed for his sushi over open coals. The delivery of sushi at perfect body temperature. These are the thousand points of lights that we know as entrepreneurs that you cannot see as an end user, but you can feel. And it helps explain what I thought were two quite surprising stats that came out of our study, maybe not when we think about it, but 70% of businesses that actually had a formal exit or an IPO did not start with a formal business plan, 70%. And it also helps explain why 61%, sorry, 61% of founders are heart-driven. Now, what about smarts? Clearly, book IQ matters to some degree. Unfortunately, for all of us that have spent a lot of money on schools and degrees, it really doesn't matter that much. What really matters in smarts, instead, are those that can look into the everyday ordinary elements like a snail, escargot, and see the Fibonacci. Those that can look and see a seemingly disarray of dots and instead find a constellation meaning. Those that get pattern recognition. Pattern recognition is at the essence and nucleus of great smart driven entrepreneurship. Now how about guts? Guts is all about the doers, people that execute. You have more Duns than to do's on your list. You're part of rare breed. Only about 15% of our population set were guts driven. It's often harder to find an amazing, excellent COO than it is a really good CEO. Now, the guts dominant manifest themselves in two ways. First, in the sprint and over time in the marathon. Another movie, your arm gets stuck in a mountain. What are you going to do? What do you do in that moment of truth? The first level of guts is the guts to initiate the guts to initiate, think about pivot points, think about hiring, firing a CEO, maybe it's yourself. Think about firing a co-founder who might be a friend. Think about those moments where you're trying to decide on getting funding. Do you have the guts to initiate? In the second level of guts, do you have the guts to endure? Perseverance, resilience, thickness of skin, stoicism. We all know that the journey of entrepreneurship is full of speed bumps. Are you resilient? and persistent. And ultimately, the highest level of the guts-dominant entrepreneur we've seen, that's the hardest level to cross, is once you achieve success, you have the guts to evolve to the next level, to a different business. And it helps explain why that 15% set of guts-dominant people has been able to fail before. 30% of them have failed, but they've gotten right back up on that horse, and it, by corollary, it helps explain why the guts dominant entrepreneur, one in three are serial entrepreneurs. Now, 
last but not least, luck. Heads or tails, fuel or fuss. It's just about chance, right? Probability, 50-50. Well, luck, it turns out, as we did our research, is a term that is perhaps the most misused in entrepreneurship. We, we label people as lucky that we want to think they're lucky because we don't have the same chance. But it's not about chance. It's about an attitude. A lot of people, we say that lucky SOB that met that founder, that met that VC. It has very little to do with chance, but by the, what, what it does have a lot to do is their attitude. And the lucky attitude that we found in 25% of the population set that really had this dominant trait, people like Tony Shea of Zappos. It starts with great humility. Do you have the capacity to believe that there are forces greater than you helping you get to your destiny? Some even call it faith. Second, intellectual curiosity, the voracious appetite to seek new experiences, always test what's new. And third, optimism. Optimism is that willingness to suspension of disbelief that gives the energy to realize the humility and intellectual curiosity. One test for you all, because all of you are saying, we're optimistic people. Okay, so one test that we saw and we used is the 24 rule. The next time someone says an idea at LeWeb here or at the, at the startup competition across the way, can you wait 24 seconds, just 24 seconds, before criticizing one element of it? And if you're really good, you'll do as my mentor, Jay Chide, who founded Chayat Day, a visionary in advertising, said, can you actually wait an entire day to think about every reason why that idea might work before allowing yourself to think about any reason why it won't? Do you have this luck dominance? Do you have this lucky attitude? So what, we, what came out, everyone wants to know the answer. Should I be 20% hard, 50% guts, this, that? Whatever the recipe is, I'm sure it's me. It turns out that there's no single answer. There's different patterns that we found that we don't have time to go through, but the only thing you have to remember is two things. One, you need to have a baseline. If you take the test, you don't have at least the baseline of heart, smarts, guts, and luck. You should not come back to the web next year. But what you really want to be focused around is which one or two dominant traits really drive you and to have self-awareness around those one or two traits, which brings me to this session around wayfinding. Wayfinding is really about having your own self-awareness for the entrepreneur. More important than any other quality, I promise you, in great entrepreneurship is a deep self-awareness of who you are and why it is you're doing what you're doing. So how do you become more self-aware? Well, one way is the psychometric test like ours or Myers-Briggs or PI, but there's a total of five, and I'll talk briefly about the other four. Peers and mentors, do you have a set of people that are intellectually honest with you that will tell you the things that you don't want to hear as much as the compliments that you already get? Second, accountability. Do you actually write down what you say you will do and then go back and check if you've done it? People like Warren Buffett do this. I've talked about the psychometric test, the power of pause. Have you taken a moment to self-reflect, meditate? I think we have a company headspace here. To actually think about what's driven you in the past. And with that time to take pause, ultimately develop values and standards. Values and standards, not for a company that you put on a card for your wallet or plaque, but personal core principles about your own why and the standards and references you have set in terms of what you want to define as excellence. So why does any of this matter? Well, it really matters because I believe fundamentally about a fifth archetype of entrepreneurship and the biggest movement of entrepreneurship for the next decade in the purpose-driven entrepreneur. The purpose-driven entrepreneur is the entrepreneur that has that connectivity and authenticity from the soul to the product to the end user. It's the entrepreneur where purpose comes before product and product comes before profit. And of course, we've had this in the past because all the greatest companies in the world are purpose-driven. Think of Zappos. Is it a shoe company? Or does Tony Shea talk about delivering happiness as his why? Think of Ikea. Is it in the business of delivering cheap modular furniture or is it in the why 
of democratizing great design for the masses. Think of Starbucks. Are we just giving premium coffee each day, or is Howard Schultz really thinking about giving you a mini respite and a third space? The purpose-driven entrepreneur is part of the new movement, and I'm really happy for this because I've never seen so much self-awareness in entrepreneurship and the chance for something as big as a new art movement, a great movement of purpose-driven entrepreneurship. So I'll conclude with this. Ultimately, what, what that purpose-driven entrepreneur has is a self-awareness that leads to great self-congruence. And self-congruence is where you have that purest sense of why and let's look at this French compatriot demonstrating it. Why did you do this? Police took a humorless view of the act. Why did Where you do it? You? There is no way. This is probably the end of my life to step on that one. Death is very close. Et donc je criais, regardez, regardez, et il a salué. Philippe Petit, in 1973, crossing the High Wire Act across the uh, spires of Notre Dame. 1974, August 7th, the night before, shooting across with an arrow to friends on the other side, a thick cable, so that he could tighten that cable across, so the next morning with about a 50-pound pole, he can go across and do a 30-minute High Wire Act across the former Twin Towers, because he wanted to see what he can set in terms of his values and highest standard set. You see, it's not about how crazy the idea is, it's about how pure the why is. And ultimately, self-congruence is just this. It's when you're in that state where you actually do what you say, where what you say is actually what you think, where what you think is actually what you feel, and understand what you feel is actually who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Giro must have been the best movie I've seen in the last 10 years. It's yeah. just amazing. Pretty so amazing. Great. If you, if you like that guy, because he has many other talents, you've wrote a book, right? Yeah. What's the name of the book? Uh, Heart, Smarts, Guts, and Luck. Yes. <laughs> so he will be actually signing the book uh, starting at 4 p.m. and to meet the speakers. And actually, you'll also be giving away maybe 100 books. 100, 150. 150. So the first 150 of you that gets there will not only get a chance to talk sushi with him, <laughs> but also to get his book. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you.